I don't know about you, but my kids, they have had their fill over the last couple of days with Thanksgiving. They have been so sugar high, it's been insane. I'm waiting for like the crash moment to occur. It just has not happened yet. But it is good to be here uh, together uh, to be able to worship God in this season of Thanksgiving. Um, Before we dive into the sermon, we're going to hear from the word of the Lord today. And we stand for the hearing of God's word because we're hoping and praying and Holy Spirit driven that we will catch something that is said, that we will be transformed by it and by words that may never even come out of my mouth, but words that are spoken to you directly from God. So hear these words from Matthew 15. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it the dogs. Yes, it is, Lord. She said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This is the reading of the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Take a seat. So um, my oldest son, when he was in kindergarten, his class had a series of lessons that were opportunities for parents to come in and teach these lessons that were kind of outside the regular curriculum on life lessons and stuff like that. And I was given the opportunity to come in and do a couple of teachings on the difference between a need and a want. And... Although the kids in there are brilliant and they're amazing, my son, of course, at the top of the list, but they were an amazing batch of kids. You can imagine the hilarity of trying to communicate with five and six-year-olds and figure out what they consider a need and a want. Because when you're in kindergarten, everything is a need. Everything. I need this toy. I need you to do what I'm asking. I need this. I need that. And raising kids, one of the things that we do quite often is helping them understand, no, no, you want this. You don't need this. Or you think you want this, but you really need this. This is just what we do as parents at the earliest age possible with all the grace and the love that we can share because we all do it really well, right? Okay, liars in the room, that's fine. <laughs> and it's funny, like with kids, that we, that we have to do this, but honestly, it's not just something that's with kids. I, I find that at every stage of life, we have to have the question of what is a need here and what is a want in any given situation. So it's not just a kid thing, it's an all of us thing. And typically... Usually some outside force will kind of help determine for you what is a need and what is a want. Think about it. Like most people these past couple of days, you have rediscovered your need for family and connection. Because you've sat around the table, you've eaten the amazing food, you've looked across at your family and maybe some friends, and you've thought, man, I need this more than ever right now. And I just don't get it. That's because we have a need to belong and to have unconditional love and purpose. Or many of us find ourselves in moments of crisis that very quickly show us what we really need. When everything gets taken away and all of a sudden what's there is what you actually need versus what you want. Most of the time in our lives, Because we're so hurried and busy and at times distracted and overscheduled and overstressed, our needs can get buried under wants. And when I say the word need, obviously we're talking about the necessities for life. And when we talk about the wants, we're talking about the privileges and preferences that we experience in this life. But when our needs get buried under our wants, 
our wants can start to drive everything in our life. They steer our hearts. They steer our minds and whatever they can get satisfied, they get satisfied. And this is an important thing because our soul has needs. Every soul on this planet has needs that are specifically created to be satisfied only in God. Your soul has needs for identity, to know who you are. And the ultimate way we find that out is by learning that we are indeed a child of God. Your soul has needs for belonging, acceptance, unconditional love. And we find that we can belong to and in God and be a part of his family. Your soul has needs for purpose, mission. Ultimately, our purpose is to glorify God by loving him, loving others, and making disciples of his son, Jesus Christ. But even these core needs that we all have can get buried under wants that we have. And if we mistaken a want that is actually a need, we're in trouble. Now follow closely here with me because this hopefully doesn't get confusing. Um, and it may not sound like a big deal, but it actually is. Um, you may think to yourself, yes, it's okay to want God, to want to be in church, to want these things of faith, these soul needs, but they're not just wants, they're needs. And the minute we start mistaking a need for a want, things become more about privilege and preference over the pure need that we have. I'll I'll give you an example. So um, our bodies need water. Every person in the room needs water, right? Tracking with me, please. If you don't need water, we need to talk. I'm going to know what you're doing. (laughs) We all need water. But because we have such an abundance of it in this life, and we can just go to the jewel or the store and look down the aisle, and there's nothing but every single type of water, we start to mentally start to trade that need for water for a want of the kind of water that I want, right? So for those of you that have a particular favorite type of water, I like ice cold water. I want my water ice cold. And by ice cold, you can ask my family, it annoys them to no end. I will take a full glass of ice water and put it in the freezer and wait for that thin layer of ice on top where I can kind of poke through with something and get that icy cold water. I want that water. I love it. And my family often is like, glass in the freezer again. Or maybe you like spring water. You can't do regular tap or whatever. You got to have spring water. You got to have that special water that comes in a glass or whatever you get from the store that costs like eight bucks. It's taken from the polar ice caps or whatever. We have a need, but we turn it into a want, and that's when privilege and preference start to take over. Now, if we were in the middle of a desert, haven't taken any liquid in for a day, it's 100 plus degrees, and our lips are cracked and bleeding, and we are dehydrated, and we have nothing around us, and we find some water, we will take that water in whatever capacity we can, in whatever form we can. It doesn't matter if it's hot, cold, whatever. We will take it because it's what we need to survive. Why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because our relationship with God and the deep connection we have with each other as the body of Christ and the living out of the calling and purposes God has over our life. If we treat those needs as they are in a want fashion, we will miss everything. We will miss the ability to really live into what God is calling us to. And it sounds harmless. We say things like, hey, I want to be close to God. That is fantastic. (laughs) I hope we all want to be close to God. But you may wake up one day, and not feel like you want to anymore. That's just a reality. I want to be in church. I'm glad you want to be in church. Trust me. I know how today was going to look. And you showed up. And for what this Florida boy would say is freezing, awful, cold weather. Although it was fun. My daughter and I got up this morning and we were shoveling the snow outside. And over here is great. Eric helped out. It was fantastic. But y'all showed up today because you wanted to be in church. 
That's fantastic. My kids want to be in church. I don't want that to ever change. But I know one day it will. One day my kids will wake up. One day you may wake up and you just don't want to today. You just don't want it. Or what's actually more common is somebody hurt you. You experienced some sort of pain in the church. And not only do you not want to go to that particular church, but it's really difficult for you to see yourself ever donning the doors of a church again. These are experiences we all have, and it's at times because we've treated these things as wants. See, our wants in life change, and they shift, and they're based on seasons and different times and places in our life, and it really ends up kind of being about us and what we want and our preference. When we live a faith that is quickly turning into more about want than need, we start to live out a faith that's really on our own terms, on our own conditions. This is a faith that's really built kind of like on shifting sand, given the season you're in in life, or a faith that can't deal with challenges or obstacles and hardships. A faith that wants God to show up, but wants him to show up in a particular way, the way you want him to. And it's a faith that needs the church to be perfect, which we all are, but not every church is. You were supposed to laugh at that point. <laughs> this is a faith that needs the church to be perfect and kind of made in their image and answer all the questions and never mess up and never do anything wrong. And this is a faith that will only activate when God shows up in big, miraculous, and clear ways, telling us exactly what we should do and how we should do it. And I'm not trying to be mean or offensive. It's just the reality of it. This is also a very weak faith. This is a faith that is easily defeated, a faith that is terrified more than it is trusting, and a faith that must stay in the shallow end of the pool, even though Jesus constantly calls us into deeper and deeper and deeper waters. But thankfully, we have this story that we're looking at today. We have examples all the way through the scriptures, but this particular story I love in this story, we encounter a woman, a very unlikely encounter with a woman in Jesus who knows the difference between, between a want and a need. And she shows us a different kind of faith. The story starts off with Jesus taking his disciples, as one commentator put it, from um, you know, the, the promised land to the pagan land. Uh, Tyre and Sidon were major cities at the time, but they were also inhabited by non-Jews and long-standing enemies of the Jewish people. So it says, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And who should meet him there? A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. We've got a couple things going on here. One, she's a Canaanite. Canaanites and Jews, long-standing hostility. They don't mix. They don't talk. And she's a woman. Why is she even talking to Jesus? This is a conversation that should not be taking place. And it's so strange the way this conversation unfolds, right? This is the last person we'd expect to come to Jesus and also notice not just come to him and beg for him, but give him a title. She, said, she calls him Lord, Son of David. A Canaanite would not have used this language at all. But she apparently has heard of him. She seems to be knowing that he can provide healing. And we totally sympathize with her. You've had sick children. You've known children who have gone through a hard time. Kids who have passed away. We can relate to this woman who wants her child to be okay and knows that Jesus is what she needs. But how does Jesus respond? He responds beautifully, doesn't he? Jesus did not answer a word. So the disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out to us. He didn't say a word. Seriously? Have you ever had another story that you've read in the Gospels where someone has come to Jesus in need 
in the very desperate place in their life and Jesus doesn't even say anything to them? No. This is his bread and butter. <laughs> desperate, broken people in need of him. He is all, he's Johnny on the spot, man. Gotcha, healing, going to surprise everybody. But this particular person in this moment, he says nothing. You don't have to know much about the Bible or Jesus to know this is weird. This is very, very strange. There must be something going on here. And the disciples, of course, are helping out and being awesome. They're trying to shoo her away. I'm sure they were ecstatic, to be honest with you. Finally, he gets it. <laughs> He's not hanging out with Canaanites or these other Gentiles. Finally, he gets it. It's about us. It's about the Jews. It's about what's going on. You know, it's about what we need and what we want. We're following him. I'm sure they were ecstatic. At some point, I'm sure they were like, can we get rid of Matthew now too, the tax collector? Can he like get out of here too? I'm sure they're happy about this. But this woman has a faith that won't stop. And so she keeps crying out to him. I imagine Jesus just kind of walking along. He ignores her and she just keeps pushing through and keeps going after him, crying out for him, crying out for him. And then he says these words. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Now he's making it clear, she's not even a primary mission. He's not even thinking about her. Again, not something we're used to. Now, we can kind of see a little bit if we've read the Gospels up until this point, maybe what Jesus was talking about. We're going to go back real quick to Matthew 10 when Jesus sends out his disciples to proclaim the kingdom of God in their areas. And he says, uh, these 12 disciples sent out, uh, that Jesus sent out with the following instructions. And so he told them, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. So we see this, but we also know that Jesus has had these interactions with non-Jews all the way through his ministry. He's had interactions with people who are not Jewish and not a part of this fold. And so what's going on here? I'm sure she was confused. She had maybe heard about how he healed uh, the person who was associated with the centurion, right? That he had actually gone out and taken care of people who weren't just Jewish. And so now, what's going on? This is very confusing. I think what Jesus is actually doing here is really important. And we got to get the full scope of the biblical picture to see what's going on here. He is laser focused on not just the mission, but the fulfillment of the story of God and where it's headed. He is making it clear, not just to this Canaanite woman, but to the disciples as well, that this is all headed towards something. He is this embodiment of the future calling towards all nations, but at first it's going to start with the Jews. Because the Jews were told early on in their history, you're blessed to be a blessing. You are to be a light to the nations. And so if we see the biblical scope here, and we see God's story playing out, all of creation involves all people, right? All nations. And then that breaks apart, sin, humanity, mess it all up. And God chooses one family, Israel, to be his chosen people, to be the light to these nations, which includes, of course, King David. And all the way through, they mess it all up, constantly. They don't do what they're called to do. They're not the people of God that they're called to be. And so Jesus, son of David, comes, and he is God on earth, not just dealing with economic sins and social issues, but dealing with the issues that have been prevailing in humanity since the very beginning, the issues of sin and death and suffering. But he first goes to Israel. He first goes to the Jews, who are supposed to know their calling. Go first to the lost Jews, those that don't understand what they're called or who they're supposed to be. And obviously we can see this in the scriptures, right? Twelve tribes. How many disciples are there? Twelve, right? But then, towards the end of his ministry, he tells those disciples and those following him, therefore, go and make disciples of what? All nations. Baptizing them in the, name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that's where it's all headed. Towards all nations. Towards reaching all people. But he's first going to start here. 
with the Jews. And so to a degree, we can kind of, I'm going to say give Jesus a pass. We can understand where he's coming from. He's laser focused right now. I also think Jesus understands that there's something about this woman. There's something about her faith that's going to not only show something about her, but also show something to the disciples about how faithful a Gentile can actually be. And so as she's walking, this woman comes and she kneels before him. Now, you got to get this image in your head. Jesus has been walking. He's ignored her. He said, I've only come for the lost sheep of Israel. He's ignored her the whole time. I picture her like running in front of him and just kneeling on the ground. Lord, I need your help. It's in a worshipful posture. This is not just an ask. This is everything to her. Everything. And so Jesus answered her in a way, of course, that we would expect him to. He says to her, it is, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. What? You're not finding this on a coffee cup. <laughs> right? Like, this is not how Jesus should be acting. This woman is giving everything she's got, and now you're calling her a, a, a dog and her people a dog, which is honestly something quite common at the time. This is Jesus. Now, given the understanding of the mission we just heard about, that there's a trajectory happening here towards all nations, that he's going to start first with the Jews, we can maybe kind of, kind of understand it. And I've read some commentators that, um, I don't know, they kind of try to make it not sound as bad as it sounds. They say, listen, it's not a street dog he's talking about. The word here is like, your, your home dog, right? You're the dog that you love, like your Marley and me or your Lassie. <laughs> like it's a family dog that just is getting the scraps off the table. I don't know about you. I don't care. <laughs> I, it does not matter to me. He calls her a dog. He calls her a dog. That's hard to read. Now, at this point, let's be honest. You and I would have been done. We would have been done probably a long time ago. We come to Jesus with the need of our sick child. And he ignores. That drives a lot of people away. Feeling like God has ignored them. His disciples, church, has disrespected her and tried to shoo her away. Plenty of people have been shooed away by the church or felt like they did not belong. Jesus makes it clear she's not actually the primary mission. And now he's saying that she's not the one he's thinking of primarily at this table, but the scraps that are sent to a dog. It's almost as though Jesus is pushing her, testing her, trying to see what's really there. And look at what she says. This is amazing to me. This should blow your mind, honestly. And that, but we'll, we'll do it together so we can read like the dramaticness, the dramaticness, <laughs> it's not a word, folks. <laughs> the, the, the beauty here, and yes, the drama of it all, right? He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. She says, yes, it is, Lord. That is so scrappy. <laughs> that is so like, what? Yes, it is, Lord. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. So when this woman is pressured, let down, refused, pushed away, seemingly by Jesus himself, when her faith is tried and tested, the core of her is not her wants, her desires, her preferences, her privileges. There is a core need that she has, despite all of this stuff, for Jesus. I need Jesus. And then look at what he says about her. Then Jesus said to her, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and her daughter was healed at that moment. He never even calls his disciples' faith great, ever. But this woman, he says, your faith is great. Jesus shows these disciples that actually I am for all people <laughs> and for all nations, but he also shows and reveals something important. There is a kind of faith that is willing to take anything of Jesus because Jesus is everything we need. You understand what I'm saying? There is a faith that's willing to take the scraps, 
that doesn't need it all to be perfect. It can take anything from Jesus because he is everything we need. It doesn't matter how little I get. It doesn't matter that it's not all perfect or exactly what I want. This woman shows us a scrappy faith, a faith that is fine taking a little bit it can get. There's a faith that doesn't need all the questions answered all at one time to our satisfaction in order for us to believe. There is a faith that doesn't need a neat and clear mapped out plan in order for us to take the next or new step. There is a faith that doesn't need Jesus to give you a big sign or miracle to know that you can trust him. There is a faith that doesn't need God to jump through whatever hoops you put in front of him to prove that he's there. I've sat across the table from plenty of people who know who God is. They were raised in church. They had certain experiences and stuff. And at the end of the day, there is a pain in their eyes because God didn't show up in the way they thought or the church hurt them or whatever the case may be. There is a faith, though, that knows how to move beyond that to something new and honestly exciting. It's a fighting faith, a scrappy faith that knows all it needs is Jesus. It's a faith that is not afraid to be desperate and honest about what it needs. It is a faith that isn't afraid to just kind of deal with the dismissive disciples and deal with church issues and whatever, but focuses on the one to whom has called you. There is a faith that begs God for mercy and intervention, and even when not a word is said, still worships still praises, and still seeks. It's a a faith that can test, take the tests of Jesus at times, positioning us for an even greater faith can be developed. We often think that our faith will deepen with the bigger the moment or the miracle, right? The bigger the moment or the miracle, the more my faith is going to get more real. No, no. Your faith is developed. Our faith is developed when we are able to make much of the little that we have. Where we can hear the faintest whisper of his voice and still obey. When we have all the obstacles in front of us and we still move forward. Think about the Israelites, right? The Hebrews, when they were freed from slavery. Their whole life was encapsulated and kind of capstoned with what moment? You remember? Red Sea, parting. Freedom from Egypt. Red Sea is parted. That's the big moment. That's the big miracle. That's the big thing. That should change them forever. And it doesn't. They walk right through the Red Sea and they wander and they wander because what the real test was was not the Red Sea moment. It was the manna on the ground. It was God's provision in the small. This woman doesn't need a Red Sea moment. All she needs is for Jesus to be her manna in the wilderness, her daily bread. This is a kind of faith, friends. Oh, man. It changes everything. Do you need a Red Sea miracle in order to honestly have faith? Let's be honest. Some of us do. Let's just be real. We've had times in our life where we want the Red Sea. Take the manna. Take the manna. Jesus will do something with it you couldn't possibly ask for or imagine. Um, Leslie, my wife, her mother passed away um, a while ago uh, from cancer, very aggressive cancer. But I'll never forget a moment that has stuck into my and, and her and everybody who was there's mind. Her mom was in the hospital. She had a major diagnosis of cancer, and um, we just, we knew the end was coming. But she was in the hospital getting treatments and whatnot, and she had made the decision, no more treatments, I want to go home and be with my, my family, live out the rest of my life there. And she wanted to see her daughter graduate from college. She wanted to be there to see it. And so the doctors were like, okay, you can do that. But you got to be able to eat something and keep it down, and we'll let you go home. And so she loved New York-style pizza, the far superior pizza, Chicago folks. Sorry. We'll talk later. But she loved New York-style pizza, and there was this place called Chow Bella that she, that she loved. And so went out, and we got her a slice of pizza, this one little slice of pizza. Brought it to her in the hospital. And I will never forget 
watching her eat that piece of pizza like it was everything to her. It, was, it wasn't just that she wanted it. She needed it to be able to go home and be with her family and be with her husband and her kids and to, to die in peace. She needed it in order to get there. That, that image has been burned into my brain because oftentimes we treat the church and the things of God like it's some big buffet. I can take what I want. I, I like this. I like this. Oh, I'm not interested in this. I'm definitely not trying that. We treat like it's a buffet when it's supposed to be this little, little scrap that we can honestly live off of and that will get us to where we need to go. Friends, we need Christ not just to be in our lives, but at the very center. We need to belong and be the church, not just because we like it, but because we need it. We need to be seeking God's purposes for our lives because we need it. It's what we're made for. And yes, it's all the things you hear. You need to be reading your Bible and praying and this and that. And it all sounds like just do's and stuff, but it's not. It's the little bit. Just the other day, I was reading a passage, and I was like, I don't get what's going on here. I don't see why it matters. Put the Bible away, picked it back up. I read it again out loud, slowly, and all of a sudden, new things opened up to me. All of a sudden, it was a source for me that lasted me the whole week. This is what we need. We need to be a people of prayer, finding ourselves caught up in God's story. We cannot be satisfied by waiting for this all to be a want. It must be a need. And I'll tell you, this is an evangelistic issue. Because one of the reasons why I think a lot of people in our lives, in our workplaces, schools, and other places don't recognize their need for Jesus is because the Christians around them don't seem to really need him too. Friends, we need to take every opportunity we can to make Jesus much in our life, to make him everything. We need to take every opportunity to dive deep into what it means to be the connected body of Christ here in this church. Don't let obstacles and hardships hold you back from what you really need in this life. Show those around you what you need. Start by just committing to knowing in your mind and your heart this is a need for my soul. And I promise you, God will show up. Not all the time the way you want him to, but he'll show up in the way that you need. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift that it is to be in this place. We come into this place for an hour, but it's an hour spent with you and your people, and it does not just so much for us, it transforms us. We've heard your word proclaimed. Help us to live into it each day because, God, we need you. Help us to worship with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. All God's people said, amen.